So I'm going to offer you just a, a few things, and Ralph will correct everything that I say because I got it from Wikipedia. So, uh, uh, but I want to just give you a sense of things. Because he's had a really interesting career path, and I think you'll appreciate that. And then his remarks will kind of highlight uh, why it's his approach to governance uh, as mayor, two-term mayor in Salt Lake City, uh, kind of fit with uh, perhaps a, a trajectory. And uh, so. So Ralph Elihu Becker Jr. It's important to know this. He's a two-term mayor, as I mentioned. He was born in Washington, D.C., and his father was Ralph Elihu Becker. So this is Jr. And he was, at, uh, under President Ford, the ambassador to Honduras for two years. So he had a diplomatic start. Uh, and uh, he went to the University of Pennsylvania, got his bachelor's. He went to the University of Utah Law School and got his Juris Doctor. But then three or four, four years, maybe five years, four years later, he went back to the uh, Geography and Planning School and got an MS from the University of Utah. So he's got a legal and a planning degree, and he is one of three fellows of the American Institute of Certified Planners in the state of Utah. So. Uh, so he has a, a planning idea, and he, but he's also got a, a legal background. Um, his uh, career, he did work for a, a number of years in the planning context. In fact, he served uh, as Governor Scott Matheson's state planning coordinator. So much like uh, in the olden days, community affairs, if Jim Murley's in the room, uh, he, will, he will recall the role. Um, and. Um, he then spent six years in the Utah House of Representatives, and four years of that six years, he was the House Democratic leader. Now, remember, we're talking about the state of Utah. So we've talked all through this conference about isolation and loneliness. So, so, <laughs> so, so um, he was when he was in the legislature. He was. Uh, I will say he was responsible for, but he'll say no, it was a, a team effort. But they passed the Quality Growth Act in 1999, which uh, really helped to enshrine uh, protection ideas in terms of trails, recreation areas, as well as urban planning concepts. So I probably mangled that a bit, but you get the sense that uh, he was a, uh, very actively engaged in sort of thinking about the state's future and thinking about how to how to sort out some of the uh, ideas that were happening in other states, like Florida and Oregon, uh, who had sort of committed to urban planning as a, as a concept that um, was institutionalized. So he, um, in, I guess in 2006, 2007, I think he, you started your first term in 2007 as mayor, and, uh, and they went two terms, and uh, he, in the, towards the end of his second term, he was, uh, he became the president of the National League of Cities, so he had a leadership role, and I know that there are other things that happen before you become president, but uh, so he's been actively involved in the National Civic League as well. And uh, my connection with Ralph, uh, we both serve, serve and served on a uh, board uh, called the Policy Consensus Initiative, which was a national effort that combined governors, state legislatures and centers like the Consensus Center at, at Florida State and then 30 or so centers at other universities around other states. And so Ralph and I had a chance, in that context he was a state representative on a national board kind of weighing in on ideas for collaboration and consensus in, in the context of planning and other issues. So with Without uh, saying any more, he's, he's uh, got, uh, I think, some great ideas to share with us about the role of elected leaders in the context of civic advance and civic engagement. So, Ralph? Bob, thank you. I wouldn't dare correct you on those items. Um, and uh, what a pleasure it's been for me these last uh, two days, day and a half so far, to uh, be part of this gathering on Civic Advance and to listen and learn um, and to see some of the great things that are going on in Florida, uh, despite what you see in terms of 
numerical, statistical numbers. Uh, it's obvious that the energy and what's going on here is, um, is really impressive, I think. Um, and I shouldn't be surprised with how good this program is, given Bob Jones and the way he pulls people together and, and, uh, and attracts a lot of good people. And I, Brian Deloge, who I've known for a while, I know isn't here, but I know he's been very involved with this. And uh, it's been nice getting acquainted with a number of you, including Stuart Langdon. And I want to thank uh, Marilyn Crotty for her work. Uh, quietly doing all the stuff that makes this possible, and Susan, who's been sitting out there at that desk the whole time, um, which is remarkable. I don't think I could do that. Um, and I want to thank Scott Payne, because um, the Florida League uh, sponsored my ability to come here. So I'd like to add a little bit to, um, to what has been, seems to me, an incredibly meaningful discussion that you've been having and I'm going to reflect a bit on my uh, own experiences uh, and observations that will be reinforcing some of the points that people have been uh, talking about these last few days. Um, and, uh, and maybe introducing some others uh, or strengthening some others. Um, and uh, uh, obviously from the perspective of an elected official, which um, is unique and I think um, is not well understood probably for good reason uh, among people who, uh, who interact uh, regularly or are observing elected officials. First of all, let me just tell you quickly where I come from and as Bob mentioned, it's something that we share and it seems like everyone in this room shares, uh, which is that good civic engagement uh, just brings us to better solutions. And it's, uh, it's a key, in my mind, to good governance and good government, but it's also a key to uh, developing and creating the kinds of communities and places and societies that we, that we want and that function well. Um, also, I'd say as a very general observation before jumping into uh, too many things, is that it is not easy um, it's not easy, particularly today, I think, because uh, people are so stretched in their lives, um, whether that's um, because how busy they are uh, or because of the way our, the pace of our society or because of the, the way that the media tends to, tends to work today. Um, and I think that makes it particularly difficult for elected officials and for people who observe or interact elected officials or hopefully uh, decide to vote because trying to distinguish uh, genuine um, leadership I think is especially difficult today. And I don't think we get much help from the media today. I think there was a time when the media really served this filtering role for information that we get and you could rely on the media as a, as a place for information that more often than not was accurate information. And I, I don't think that necessarily holds today with obviously you know, some, ex some exceptions there. But it's really difficult, I think, to distinguish collaborative leaders, and everyone says they want collaborative leaders, from the charlatans that are out there who just use the words. And I think that makes it tough for, uh, for elected leaders but I think if, we, if, you, if you think about stereotyping or generalizing elected leaders, it's like st stereotyping or generalizing any group. There's a wide range, about as wide a range as you get in any group or certainly throughout society. Um, so elected, I think elected leaders face uh, particular challenges today. And, uh, and a lot of it, of course, is self-created. We have too many people in office who either are involved in malfeasance or don't seem to really care about what their job should be. Um, so that's unfortunate. Uh, I'm going to spend a little more t uh, time talking about my background because one of the things I've appreciated in this, uh, uh, in this, this, these meetings is I've really enjoyed listening to people's sort of personal stories and how that relates to what they're doing. And Bob described uh, certainly uh, some of it, I, I grew up on a farm in Washington, D.C. No, I'm just kidding. Of course, there's no farms in Washington, D.C. But it sounds good if you're a politician, right? You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, 
Uh, and I grew up in a family that in many respects was privileged. My parents were upper middle class. I never worried about where my food or shelter was coming from. Schooling was taken for granted, and I had good schooling. Um, I also, though, grew up in a family where from a very early age I was inculcated with this sense that um, uh, I needed, we, all of us in our family needed to give back to our community, that there was this social conscience that was just expected of us, um, and, um, and we saw it reflected in our own uh, parents' activities beyond uh, the work they were doing. Um, as I kind of went through and, and finished school, uh, I should say while I was in school, I worked for the National Park Service. I had grown up on the East Coast, gone, was in school on the East Coast. I started working at the Grand Canyon for the National Park Service. And um, that really is what kind of got me oriented towards really a public service career um, and also to the West. I, um, I loved the National Parks. I actually thought I was going to make a career of the National Park Service. And uh, I found when I went back east, that was in an era, and for me, when I was hitchhiking back and forth across the country. And I got, when I was going back from, uh, from the Grand Canyon to Philadelphia, where I was in school, and got to St. Louis, I went, what am I doing? This is not as nice a place as where I've been. And so anyway, I ended up migrating west about as quickly as I could with finishing school. Um, and then I, um, I worked for a consulting firm for a little while and then went to work, as Bob mentioned, for a governor in Utah, uh, Scott Matheson, who was a brilliant leader, is still revered today, even though it's decades later in, in Utah and learned an awful lot about um, uh, of the way an elected official and leader should conduct himself or herself. But I got brought in uh, to work with him uh, at his invitation on a very complex multi-jurisdictional matter that he was pursuing as kind of his pet project. And I have found that throughout my, uh, my career that those are the things that, uh, that I enjoy and that I seem to engage in the most. These sort of complex uh, issues that often stretch public and private concerns a lot and, um, and are challenging to find solutions. Um, when, when Governor Matheson left office, I did. Um, I participated in my community, in my neighborhood. Uh, I was on a planning commission in Salt Lake City. I uh, started my own business, which I had for over 20 years as a planning, mostly planning and environmental consultant. And along the way, as Bob mentioned, uh, got on the board of, um, of policy, this policy consensus initiative, and it was like a, a revelation to me. There are these people who actually worked in the field of things that I had been doing but didn't have a category for, uh, of people who bring folks together and try to figure out solutions to issues. Um, and that really sort of started giving me more of a framework for what, uh, what it is that we're all about in governance. Um, because uh, I'm pretty experiential in the way that I, uh, that I learn things and do things. So um, it, one thing just kind of led to another. I ended up uh, serving in the legislature for, actually it was 11 years for six terms, uh, and then two terms as, a, as mayor, um, and taught classes as it turned out as well. Um, but um, it sort of, that's sort of the framework for me when I, I say entered uh, the mayor's office, was that uh, background. Um, let me also describe Salt Lake City, because we all love our communities. Um, but it'll give you a sense of uh, maybe some things in terms of you know, why I'm there and why it's become this destination for people migrating to new places to live. Um, Salt Lake City, is this, many of you know it or have certainly seen pictures of it. It's a mountain valley. Um, at about 4,500 feet in elevation, with the mountains rising abruptly from the valley floor over 7,000 feet. And so those mountains serve as our, uh, as our backyards. Um, and they also are the primary source of water um, in the city. The uh, top of Little Cottonwood Canyon gets over 500 inches of snow a year, and we don't have snow in the valley usually that goes all the way through the year. That elevation just makes all the difference. It makes for a striking place and a very inviting place. 
if, uh, if like me, you like outdoor recreation, recreation activities. Of course, everyone knows it as the home of the LDS Church, the 15 million uh, members of the, uh, of the LDS Church, and that plays a central role obviously in the state of Utah, and in actually in the whole region, and certainly for Salt Lake uh, City where the headquarters are located. Um, this, uh, so I, I went out of office at the beginning of 2016, and I took uh, what the younger generation today would call a gap year, uh, what uh, us older folks would call a sabbatical. Um, and had a great year uh, doing that. And then this year, I have been spending half my time uh, with a fellowship called a Leadership and Government Fellowship. It's the first year they've done this out of the, from the Open Society Foundation, um, where um, they wanted to pick senior government officials leaving office who wanted to do something for a year, and they would basically support them with a nice stipend. So this last year, I, uh, this year, uh, I'm in, getting towards the end of this year, I have been um, looking at a, the question of leadership and what is it that makes for an effective uh, elected official. And I don't define effective here as getting elected, although that's obviously requisite number one. I'm talking about it in terms of uh, an elected official that is serving their, his or her constituents. Um, and, is, uh, and is really advancing, in the case of a city, um, advancing uh, a, a community. Um, and, uh, and so I've uh, reflected on my own experiences, but then I've also focused in on uh, a few cities that I thought were partic had particularly strong leadership that were very different. I wanted to pick very different cities. Um, and spent time in those cities meeting with the mayor, but then meeting with people who interact with the mayor, private and public sides, to get their sense of what it is that's led to that effectiveness of a city. And I'm in the process um, now, I'd say, of trying to distill um, that, and I'm, I related to the, uh, the comments this morning about trying to write, because my idea of writing for a lot of years was uh, reviewing things other people wrote, writing comments in the middle of the night, to sort of keep everything going, uh, but never producing very much myself. And now I'm writing this article for a journal that's actually out of uh, Florida called the State and Local Government Review. Um, and uh, it's a real challenge, I've discovered, uh, to actually write stuff for publication. So I, I'm trying to distill a lot of that, and I'm using it in, um, in various ways. Um, and it's been really a very, good fortune for me to be able to have this kind of a luxury. So I, normally when I give a talk, I give a lot of examples of things relating to the elements of what I'm talking about. But what I want to do is sort of run through some of the things that are at least at this point what my thoughts are um, about effective leadership for an elected official and, uh, and what, that, uh, what that entails, what the characteristics are, what the approaches are and I'll say that it, um, it makes a difference, but, um, and it was sort of one of the premises of my, uh, of my fellowship topic of whether you're in the minority or the majority, which is to say that if you're in the minority, um, you usually don't get to set the agenda, um, and um, you are always sort of looking for opportunities or a way to intervene in the, in the majority's efforts, whereas when you're in the majority, you do set the agenda, um, and um, and it gives you, in a way, more uh, flexibility in how you how someone approaches leadership to actually get things done. Um, now, being an executive, as I was as the mayor of Salt Lake City, you're automatically in the majority because you kind of dictate it. You sort of develop an agenda, and that agenda by virtue of the office um, and the bully pulpit and all of the things that sort of go with it, you have an ability to push things uh, as, an, as an agenda. But um, let me just talk a little bit about um, some of these elements. Um, first, as I said before, I think the word collaborative is uh, grossly abused today. Uh, it's such an important term, and in my mind, it means getting people together to work through things. and and really investing, investing in them, a lot of the decision-making authority. Um, 
And, uh, and as I said before, I think one of the challenges, and I certainly don't have this figured out yet, having lost my last election after um, having won every election by more than 60% for my eight previous elections, and having approval ratings in the mid-60s. Uh, that's a whole story on the side. Um, but um, I, I think there's a really uh, serious challenge in our democracy today to sort out people who talk about collaboration and, and collaboration in its actual use. And part of that is because uh, I think um, it's hard to decipher that. I remember when I was first running for mayor and I told my campaign advisors, like, I want to talk about consensus building and governance, and they're going, what are you talking about? No one pays attention to that. And they're actually right. People want to know what you're doing, and they don't very often pay attention to how you're doing it or how you get there. And yet, uh, that is such a critical part of, I think, success in, in governance and in results. Uh, so I say that semantics because I think it's, uh, it's a real challenge for us today in this society and in this political environment we're in to kind of sort out leadership uh, and, and effective leadership and good leadership. And there certainly are a lot of examples of all of those. And with the exception of a few folks in the media and maybe a couple of publications, uh, David Brooks is sort of a standout distinguishing commentator, for example. Uh, the media does not pay attention to it. And no matter how hard I tried, as I would go through some of these difficult decision-making processes to say, no, I realize this is controversial, but this is all part of what we do as we're trying to work our way towards you know, solutions and decisions. Uh, it was that part of it seemed to always get lost, um, I noticed in my, in my time in office. Um, so here's a quote that I saw last year that um, that sort of encapsulates uh, collaboration. There are certain things that the United States can do by itself, but if we're going to actually solve a problem, then our most important role is as a leader, vision setter, and convener. Now that was said by Barack Obama when he was being interviewed as he was getting towards the end of his term about climate change and addressing climate change. And uh, to me, that is so seldom said and observed um, as a quality um, of leadership. And you can think what you want about Barack Obama, but as someone who interacted with him quite a bit and with his team during his administration, because I pretty much paralleled, <laughs> overlapped my time in office and his, and because I was a Democrat in Utah, as was mentioned, I could, I could caucus in a closet with my fellow Democrats. Um, you know, I was sort of a, a, a go-to person uh, for his administration in Utah. Uh, he was an incredibly collaborative leader um, that often is just not uh, understood by people and the way he went about things and the way he collected people around him and helped, make helped him make decisions. So what are some of the other qualities? Um, this is one actually we, we d didn't talk about very much, Bob, I think in our work with PCI and, and kitchen table democracy, and that is to have a vision and a pretty clear set of objectives. Um, one of the uh, uh, qualities or one of the, the effects of being in elective office um, is that you are continuously deluged with what people perceive as crises, whether it's in their own lives or in their own neighborhoods or you know, in, their, in their worlds. And it is really easy to be in a purely reactive posture and to just be reacting to things that are coming on, uh, coming on to your, uh, coming through your door or your window or you know, however it gets there. And, um, uh, but I think leaders who are effective have a sense beyond reacting to stuff they have to deal with and a sense of where they want to go, where they want either their, whoever their constituency is, where, where that is, and a clear enough sense that it is both understood uh, by the people they work with but understood by the community uh, and so can be uh, the source of, um, of aspiration uh, for a place. Um, 
The uh, other thing I would say that is critical to leadership that often isn't paid much attention to um, is to have really high quality staff and to call on people outside of that staff and outside of that immediate circle um, as necessary. And uh, we all know the difference, right? When we, uh, when we see uh, stupid things being done um, or not very well thought out things being done. But uh, the fact of the matter is that as, as uh, Bob knows and I know, and many of you know, the role of an elected official particularly is so fast paced um, and with such long days that um, uh, it's other people that are really getting most of the work done. That's just a reality. Uh, I would love to have spent a lot more time on all of the things I was working on, but it just, there was no way we were gonna get things done if I didn't feel I was surrounded by people who were both smarter than me and knew more than I did, and I could help guide that or stick my fingers in it when I thought uh, we could be successful. Um, so then another thing that certainly is being talked about here and maybe is the greatest power of an elected official is the power to convene. I can tell you in all of my time, and it was almost 20 years in elective office, uh, never once that when I asked people to get involved in something, when I convened people around a topic, did anyone say no? And it did not matter if they were the head of the largest corporation or organization in the community or someone that didn't think they liked what I was pursuing, people would come. And if you can get people to the table, you're three quarters of the way there. And so that uh, ability, I think, of an elected official, which is pretty unique, it's not something that most people in the community can do, uh, is, a, I think, not very well understood and not used often enough um, power that we spent a lot of time sort of talking about with our policy uh, consensus work. Uh, and then I'd say another element that is, I'd say, difficult and has been the subject of a lot of discussion here is, is reaching out to people who normally aren't engaged. And that is a challenge for a whole variety of reasons that has been talked about here. And I, uh, I've got to tell you that I made it a focus of attention for eight years as mayor, and I don't think I ever got to a satisfactory conclusion of it. There, I, I tried about everything I could think of. I called on as much advice from as many places as I could find. But we still did not get consistently good representation from people who are, uh, I will just say, generally disenfranchised in our community, either because they don't have the time, or they don't have the interest, or they just don't believe they can, uh, they can uh, make, a, make a difference um, in, uh, in the way things are done. And uh, so I'm looking forward to, in your civic advance work and all this uh, civic engagement work that you're involved in here to continuing to learn, uh, learn from you about that. Um, and then I'd say, uh, coupled with all of that is building partnerships. Um, uh, I know that for me, um, I, in here yesterday there was some great discussions about philanthropy and about the close union between philanthropy and, and governance, really. Um, I guess I would add two other um, elements to that. Um, one uh, would be the business community. Um, the business community is, uh, sometimes the most powerful part of a community, probably depends on the community and what it is you're involved in. But um, despite, I think, again, what we do in stereotyping uh, the business world and even big business, uh, the fact of the matter is there's a wide range of both uh, corporate types and personalities at the head of those uh, um, business enterprises. And um, and if, they, if, you, if you can get them engaged, which I never found was a problem, and particularly through their organizations like Chambers, and then walk arm in arm with them, the power of, of what is being pursued on the government level expands, seems like, almost exponentially. Uh, and then the other folks who can be a real irritant at times for elected officials, the whole NGO community, all of the activist groups, um, are also um, incredibly not just important, because I think we all recognize that in, uh, in a free and open society, 
but they also are people, when you can get them to the table, which can, as I said, when you ask them, they will usually almost always come. Uh, when you can get them to the table, um, there's this cathartic experience that happens in a good process, and that is that people might start out angry. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've been in processes where it starts with people pretty much yelling at each other and staring with daggers across the table at each other, and by the end, uh, they are respecting each other and working together. And it just happens. There's something that happens about bringing people together. So these folks who are some, seem to be diametrically opposed often um, find they actually have common ground, whether it's around values or around some common objectives or just around uh, beginning to understand and respect each other's vantage point. Um, so I would sort of add, I guess, those other elements that maybe you've already covered in some of your other um, civic advancement works. Um, another element, I think, is to be opportunistic. I can't tell you how many times I can, in my career and in watching this with others now, where some unexpected opportunities just arise and you've got to be ready to jump on it when it does. Um, Bob mentioned the, what was called the Quality Growth Act which was a major sort of planning and open space uh, statute in the state of Utah. Well, it just so happened that people were starting to freak out in the state of Utah over the enormous growth in the late 90s and sort of emerged as this big topic. And it was right at the time I got elected to the legislature and other people in the legislature didn't really understand the policy uh, behind it. They all had views. And I was able, by making sure that the majority party always was in the lead uh, to be able to insert an awful lot of influence over the outcome of that policy. And that sort of happened for me over and over and over again through, uh, I say through my career, of just things that um, rose to the surface um, and were things that maybe would have been back burner um, issues or projects or whatever um, that became, uh, became available. Um, uh, finally, again, consistent with the, with the consensus building approach to things, um, and this is something that I think is hard for a lot of elected officials to do, is to listen, um, is to respond, and then to legitimately uh, address the issues that are being brought up. Uh, I think when you see sort of bulwark majorities um, or the kind of insanity that's going on in D.C. these days, Everyone's sort of into this sort of spin game and what can I force through and sort of a, I wouldn't even call it transactional um, approach to decision making. But um, that is not a very good way to make decisions. And as importantly, I think, it does not result in, in durable solutions. Um, that when people are feel they have been left out and they, or they have been left out, whether they feel it or not, um, it always seems to come back to bite a, a set of decisions um, because things haven't been thought through and anticipated and addressed along the way. So to me, that's really uh, an important feature as well. Um, finally, and I think this is really hard for politicians, uh, is to have faith in the process of what I'll just say is consensus building, of, of bringing people together and of kind of the hard work of dealing with a lot of controversy uh, and sticking, sticking to the objective through the controversy. So many times I think something gets controversial, it's like, okay, we're gonna back off and not do it. I think if, uh, if an elected official believes, it really comes to the conclusion uh, with clear eyes that something is going to be of benefit, of real benefit, then you've gotta work through all that stuff as painful as it can be, and, and sometimes as politically costly as it may be. Um, and, uh, and I think that's what brings about um, a, a community or a society, uh, society really advancing, is to work, th just continue to work through that stuff. Um, and some of that, I think, goes along with the next point I was gonna make, which is to be pretty uh, realistic about what is achievable. Um, so I'll just give you one really quick example. I was gonna try not to get into stuff too much, but what I, one of the things I decided I wanted to pursue if I got elected mayor was 
uh, to look at uh, ending, or at least from a policy point of view, ending discrimination against the LGBTQ community. Um, and, um, and I'd spent some time preparing an agenda on it. Um, and I came into office and uh, said, all right, we're going to do two things to start out with. Uh, one, uh, our city attorney had already been working on, which was to develop a domestic partnership registry so that people could have equal benefits, health insurance, life insurance, hospital visitation, estate uh, planning kinds of rights. And um, we had it for city employees, but we didn't have it for the community at large. So pursued that, and then pursued um, a non-discrimination ordinance around um, housing and employment. It was really one of the, ends up, ended up being one of the first in the country. And people were telling me at the beginning, look, you'll never get that done. Um, you'll never get it through your city council. If you do, the state legislature will come and preempt you. And it's like, well, I don't know, let's give it a shot. And we ended up actually getting both of those passed. Uh, we ended up um, withstanding an attack at the legislature. Um, and in fact, the non-discrimination ordinance five years later got adopted as statewide policy. Um, so, um, you know, I, I had my own sense of w the reasons I thought it was achievable, and it, those turned out to be right. They're not always right. There are some things I pursued that couldn't get done. But having that a, a sense of things um, is important so you don't waste too much time and energy. Those of us who are an elective officer are there for a relatively short period of time. And in my mind, we shouldn't be wasting our time just grandstanding, um, even though that does have some value. Um, so in my mind, that's another element of, um, of effective leadership. And then as, uh, related to that, too, is, um, is trying to anticipate what the problems are going to be. Because if you, if you go through a good process and you, you can see what the issues are, um, and then you fold that into what ultimately gets adopted as policy or as action, then the implementation actually gets to be easy. You know? So, I mean, what are the budgetary consequences of pursuing something? Uh, what are the legal impediments, and can they be addressed? Um, what are the effects on a a set of businesses that are going to be affected, and are there ways to address this? All those kinds of things, if you work through those at the front end, um, then the adoption gets possible and the implementation actually becomes easy. Uh, so that, that non-discrimination ordinance, um, people said it'll never work, it's gonna drive businesses, landlords crazy, and businesses crazy, and we set up a, a really simplified administrative appeals process within the city for issues that arose. Not one court case has ever arisen under that statute. Um, it became the norm of the community, and we had an easy way for people who felt they had been um, harmed on both sides, and a way to adjudicate it really easily, at least at an administrative level, still leaving court system open and we've never had an issue. Um, so those kinds of things, I think, can really make, uh, make a big uh, difference. Well, in summary, let me um, quote Gandhi. Uh, as it relates to this approach, uh, Gandhi said about democracy, uh, there go my people, I must follow them, for I am their leader. Um, and I've always kind of thought about leadership uh, in a democracy as um, I like to kayak, uh, river kayak, and um, sea kayak too, but particularly river kayaking. And you've probably seen videos of people river kayaking, and they'll be surfing on a wave. Well, on a, on a, uh, when you're surfing on a wave, there's a, there's a sweet spot. There's a place where you're just out there hanging, and everything feels great, and it's really easy. If you get too far out in front of that wave, uh, you get swallowed up by, uh, by the wave uh, taking you over. And if, you, uh, if you're not in that sweet spot and you fall back, you fall out of the wave and it's gone. Um, and I think uh, effective leadership is really in a way kind of the same thing as, as, a, as an elected official, as a politician. It's trying to find that kind of sweet spot where uh, in my mind, if you want to get things done, of, of pushing the agenda, but not going so far that you lose your public, uh, 
uh, and that hopefully is still representative of the public. Um, and then uh, not giving up just because things get tough. And um, uh, so those are some thoughts about sort of engaging the community and from the perspective of, a, of an elected official. Um, this is a, um, a particularly troubling time, obviously, I think, in our democracy. I think almost everybody feels that. Um, and, uh, and it's really hard to get, uh, to get sort of enthusiastic about sort of the daily show that's coming out of, uh, out of uh, Washington. Uh, on the other hand, I will say that having uh, served in federal, state, and local government, that in local government, it is a whole different ballgame. Um, that in local government, um, when I get together and uh, with other elected officials, it's not about people whining about things. It's about what are you doing that I can steal an idea about and what's working and what's not working. And, uh, and everyone is trying to compete in a very healthy way with how they can advance their communities. And the reason that is so important in our democracy is because 80% of the people in this country live in cities, and 90% of the GDP comes from cities. And so if at the local level, which is the easiest place to do this kind of work, because it's on the ground and people have a direct experience with it, uh, if as local officials and elected officials, and then this gets the support from folks who are engaged like you are in getting people engaged, if that works, our country is still going to work regardless of the show uh, that is going on uh, at the national level. Um, so I just want to um, thank you for this uh, incredible work that you're doing and that I think all of us here are probably part of. And, um, and end with a quote from Edmund Burke, who I don't even know really who he is other than he was some famous old British character, um, <laughs> who said, um, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. This was in an era when gender uh, was used as equally for men and women, saying men. Um, so um, I thank you for the work that you're doing for advancing our civic um, engagement and uh, look forward to seeing what you're doing and learning from what you're doing and, and I appreciate you having me here with you. Sure. Yeah. So we've got a little bit of time to take a couple questions and then we've got a panel to respond to what you just heard. So got a Don with the student pergs. Um, first of all, thank you for working on non-discrimination. It's still legal in 28 states, including Florida, to fire someone for their sexual orientation, so that's awesome. Um, one thing that I've been thinking about is changing election machines into ongoing organizing machines past elections. So I think Obama attempted this with Organizing for America, but found that difficult to maintain. Um, have you seen operations like that switch over on the local level, and how have they worked? Um, it's a good question, and I can't say that I have seen that put into practice well. I will tell you that um, the, the election world has become so technologically sophisticated uh, that um, something like that is possible, and I know there are politicians who try to do that. It's just really tough, I think, to sustain that over time. And I, I don't know what the answers are, so if you guys are working on it with Berg, then um, it'll be interesting to see what you, what you come up with. So I don't know, if you've got answers, uh, let me know. But I, I know um, we all develop our databases, um, and we, um, we try to um, use them well to help us engage people and to be involved in decision making. But it's really tough to keep that momentum up after an election, has been my observation and experience. Hi, thank you so much for being here. I'm Joe Vita with Volunteer Florida, and we're the State Service Commission, so I know we have one in, in Utah as well. Um, I had a quick question. So let's say you are a layperson, and you're John Doe, you live in Salt Lake City, 
you have five minutes with the mayor and you say, how can I get involved in my community? What are the top three or four things that you're gonna say, and get involved in local government specifically, because I think you, you spoke to it and we've heard it a number of different times, just these barriers, barriers to entry. People either feel like they're not going to make the difference or their input isn't being heard. I know a lot of times the feedback loop isn't there, so citizens go to a town hall, they hear in the news about an answer, the solution isn't what they wanted, they assume they weren't heard when really they don't know anything about the compromises and the process that's in place to get to that solution. But if you were gonna say, hey, these are the ways that you can most affect the community that you live in when it comes to local government, what are a couple of those things? Well, I would, I would invite you to run for office. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and everybody here, I mean, I come from, uh, you know, one of my sort of professions is planning, planning profession, and, you know, planners get all this stuff, but they, they don't step out very often, and for some of it's for really good reasons. Um, actually, I would uh, do those kinds of things. I, first of all, I think sort of town halls and standard public hearings are some of the poorest way to be able to get public feedback and input, um, because it's it tends to just lend itself to grandstanding rather than constructive input. Um, I would say there are a few things that, um, that I think, there are plenty of opportunities for people to get involved. Um, and it depends a little bit on the time that they have. Uh, so one of the things that I set up when I was mayor was an online city hall. Now not everybody has access to the internet. But we, around every single issue, would put it up on a website and have an interactive feature. And we got away from some of the craziness we see around at least our um, <coughs> newspapers in, uh, in Salt Lake, and that we required people to give their real name and their real address. I mean, we wouldn't put people's address out there. But once you do that, then people become much more accountable for things that they say. Um, and we would go from 50 or 100 comments on an issue that was of interest to people to hundreds or thousands of comments coming through online. So just that sort of simple uh, procedure seemed to help us. Plus, you could see everybody else's comment, and it would sort of uh, result in, uh, in sort of a more interactive dialogue within the community. Uh, there are boards and commissions and all kinds of stuff with just about every governmental entity that are actually really good places. I had such a difficult time attracting people to do it. The idea of giving up a weekday night once a month was just too much for most people uh, to think about, even though we tried every conceivable way I can think of to try to get people to apply for those boards and commissions to reflect the diversity of the city. Um, I think outreach, um, there are so many ways to do outreach today. Um, that I think it can make a really big difference in the level of participation. But it's not just inviting people to come in, it's actually going out to where people uh, live and do their activities. So um, I, I really uh, would love to see more people run for office who care um, and not just be disgusted by what they see. <laughs> I think we, we need to take, somehow we need to take that step. You got that, Jovina? Steve Mills, um, Center for Leadership and Social Change at Florida State. I really appreciate your thoughts today. I was intrigued with the confidence um, that you have that if you bring people together, even if they have great antipathy toward one another and hang in there, that they'll eventually move to, not, if not consensus, maybe sort of a begrudging respect for one another. And I wonder if, if you could talk about how you see your role processing content in the moment when it's the hottest in the room, when there people are maybe name calling around you, over you, even right down to maybe pet phraseology you have, and just, just how you handle those moments and how you think about them. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think I, um, I seem to naturally have a calm demeanor, which helps, because um, I think if you add to the volatility, it just, uh, it just makes, things, makes things worse. Um, I think it's, uh, I'll go back to a comment that I made. I think it's just having faith in the process. That not every, if you're in a process to try to work through something, no matter how complex and controversial it is, um, you may have a bad meeting along the way. Um, but if you hang in there, and people will hang in there, uh, that is they have confidence if they come back for the next meeting, um, 
it may be a benefit. Um, then things just have a magical way of emerging. And I don't think I know what, they, what that magic is, um, but there's a group dynamic when people start to build relationships with each other uh, that happens. I mean, um, I think having really good facilitation makes an enormous difference. And um, I'll say that I've seen it all. Uh, I've seen people who are really bad at it, and I've seen people who are phenomenal at it. And having the right people facilitate who, um, who all I can say is who sort of know usually by experience how to work through those more difficult times makes an enormous difference. Um, and it's not always people who know the stuff. Uh, I had a really bad experience one time. I was dealing with a project uh, while I was mayor, and one of the city council members who was a university professor said, oh, I've got, I know someone who's great at this stuff. And I wanted to try to please a city council member because he was particularly challenging. So I said, okay. I looked at, he sent me his resume. I went, oh, this, this person would be great. Was a college professor who taught this stuff. So I said, sure, let's bring him in and have him facilitate these meetings. Well, the guy understood how to facilitate stuff, but he had no idea how to deal with difficult people. And the meetings, I finally had to walk out of the meeting because I couldn't stand watching it anymore. Um, so having good facilitation does make a difference, and there are people like that in every community and every place. Um, and, and people who are good at it can navigate their way through the most difficult situations. Okay. Jack, you had one. So Jeff and Jack, and then we'll wrap this. All right. Hello, I'm Jeff Blair with the FCRC Consensus Center. So you mentioned about, as an elected official, being a convener. So what we do is do the facilitation <coughs> that you were just describing, but every successful project we've worked on is because there has been a convener, whether it's a state or a federal agency or some, some body, uh, who's willing to invite people who will come, like you described, if you invite them, they'll come to the table. So how do you get elected <coughs> officials to be willing to convene a true good faith consensus building initiative instead of just providing the typical optics of public participation. How do you, how do you talk to an elected official? I've actually tried to do this a little bit and, and get them to recognize the true value in a consensus building process on a, on a particular issue. Yeah, can everybody hear the question okay? Um, you know, I think that's a tough one. I think there's some elected officials, and unfortunately I know too many of them who will never get it. You know, they think they have to be in charge and they've got to make the decision and, you know, they might listen to people or they might listen to a segment of the public um, and they just aren't going to get it. And so who we elect does make a big difference. Um, I will tell you, though, that you can be surprised. Um, when I was in the legislature, uh, this guy got elected. I think I'd been in for one term. This guy got elected. Um, who was from a really conservative area, and he was super conservative, but he got elected right when there was this proposal for the, the state to override a local land use decision, and, and they were running legislation through the legislature. And, um, and I can tell you, this guy had no idea what consensus building was and could care less about it. Uh, he... Um, uh, I decided I didn't like that, so I teamed up with him, and we were actually able to block that proposal, even though it was run by a lot of powerful folks in the legislature. And coming as, as after that happened, I went to him, I said, look, this is an issue that is broader than just this one project you're dealing with. It had to deal with made big regional facilities. And I said, we need a good process to have local governments be able to work out these kinds of decisions. So we went through the process in the interim. We have 45-day sessions every year in, in Utah. We went through a process in the interim. There was a consensus building process. And it was difficult, um, but we got to the end and we developed a piece of legislation. He asked that I carry the legislation. I was the minority leader in the, in the House and I said, no, you don't want me carrying this legislation. I know what will happen. I won't tell you the rest of that story. But uh, we worked on it together, and, uh, and he, through that effort, learned the value of bringing people together around a tough issue. And he later, he became head of the conservative caucus in the legislature, and then he be, he's now the Speaker of the House, became Speaker of the House. 
and he continues to use consensus building approaches. Now, if he had not seen that and experienced it, I don't know whether he attributes it to our work together, but one way or another, he picked that up as a good way for decisions to get made. It doesn't mean he doesn't play power politics, he's one of the worst at it, or best at it, depending on how you look at it. But he, uh, when he's got tough issues to work on, he, he uses a consensus building process. So I think some of it is sort of getting an elected official to experience it. And then they can see it actually makes their life easier. Um, but s some of them will never, never will. So the short answer is you have to elect them. <laughs> well, that's the easiest way to do it, um, if you can do it. But, uh, but I also, I, I guess I'm saying, um, People get elected from all walks of life, and they don't know what governance is, you know? They, maybe some issues sparked them into getting involved, and so they got involved, and then they get in, and they either learn good habits or bad habits, and if you can get to them early and show them a way that will help them solve a neighborhood issue for them, um, then that can change. I mean, I've seen it sometimes. I've seen it fail, too, so. Okay, Ralph. Yeah, do you have a pen? Because... <clears throat> uh, when you finish your article, I've got your next career, so you might want to take some notes. Okay, I will. It's called the four O's. Out of office owls, we give a hoot. <clears throat> now here's oh, how see, this is going to my, my, my brother has a, has a different version of that. So after, after I left office, he said, welcome to the owl club, Ralph who? Oh, <laughs> no, I'm turning it positive. So oh, just, yeah, yeah, just, okay. The wisdom that you bring, just like an owl, needs to be bipartisan, nonpartisan, and ethical. We have got to have a generation of former office holders who are willing to tell the truth and then gather others to a new politics. And I think you're one of the guys who can do it. Stay in touch. We will help you. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> so we can all help each other. Thank you. Thanks, Ralph.